Let's resume the zero knowledge proof session. Okay, let's begin. Uh, the next talk is Super Singular Curves You Can Trust by Andrea Basso, Giulio Cordoni, Deidre Connolly, Luca De Fio, Taco Boris Fiozza, Gerdo Maria Lido, Travis Morrison, Lawrence Pani, Shikhar Patranabis, and Benjamin Veselowski. Andrea and Lawrence will give the talk. Okay, hello. Uh, so welcome to this uh, talk. Uh, I actually learned yesterday that this is the Eurocrypt paper with the largest number of authors. So uh, yeah, this is a big collaboration. Thanks to all my co-authors. Yeah. <laughs> and uh, indeed, so um, yeah, what's the point of all of this? In isogeny-based cryptography, uh, we work a lot with super singular curves. And uh, these super singular curves have a lot of extra structure just over being a generic group, as we know. And um, one of these pieces of structure is the endomorphism ring. So uh, don't worry about it if you don't know what that is. Uh, we're going to keep this fairly high level for now. Um, and this endomorphism ring uh, is significant because it allows you to solve a lot of uh, computational problems related to these uh, objects, including the isogeny problem, which lies at the heart of large parts of isogeny-based cryptography. Uh, so uh, you can imagine in this picture here, these little arrows represent uh, endomorphisms. So it's like a curve with known endomorphism rings. And then if you have another one of these uh, curves with this extra structure, uh, that actually allows you to solve uh, the isogeny problem, which is to find a connection between these two curves uh, in polynomial time, assuming the Riemann, hypo uh, Riemann hypothesis. And um, so in some cases, these extra information can be used to backdoor isogeny-based protocols, and that's why uh, it's a topic that we very much have to worry about. Um, so getting rid of this extra structure and constructing a curve without the extra uh, information is a big open problem in our field. And uh, so it has a name, and we decided to name it uh, SECURE, which is an acronym, and it's also uh, easy to pronounce. Uh, so that is a, a super singular elliptic curve uh, for which you have good reasons to believe, whatever they may be, that no one knows uh, the anamorphism ring. Uh, so in a perfect world, we would have an efficient algorithm that kind of takes some randomness or, or some you know, maybe no randomness at all, and outputs a super singular elliptic curve, while there is no efficient algor algorithm that kind of produces the endomorphism ring along with it. Uh, the reality of this is uh, much less great than that, so I'm going to very briefly survey the state of the art on constructing super singular elliptic curves. Uh, if you don't know what this means, just uh, ignore it. So basically, uh, there's one method uh, to produce super singular curves, it's Burkitt's algorithm. Uh, it just kind of acts as a black box that outputs uh, one of these curves. Um, but uh, the only practical cases where you can do this actually also immediately produce the endomorphism ring, so that's no good. Yeah? You, you get an elliptic curve, but you also get the endomorphism ring, so that's not what we want. Um, and the other me method to produce a super single elliptic curve is to basically take one of those curves and then do a random walk in an isogeny graph. Uh, so it looks a bit like this. You have your starting curve. By necessity, you know the endomorphisms because that's the only ones we know how to construct. And then you take some random walk to another curve, but actually it turns out that this connecting isogeny also kind of allows you to transport the, the anamorphism ring. Uh, so none of these methods work. And um, then the question, of course, becomes, what's the next best thing? What can we actually do? And this is kind of like a folklore method that has been known to many people for a long time. Uh, and it is to, again, do this kind of random walk, but uh, distribute the trust across many different people. So again, you start from some super single elliptic curve, zero, and then the first participant uh, kind of just does a random walk, outputs the end of this random walk, and uh, keeps his isogeny psi1 secret. And then the next participant does the same thing, and you do this over and over again until you're satisfied that uh, enough people have contributed to this, and the result is actually a secure-er. Um, so this is clearly secure as, lo as long as at least one of these participants is trustworthy. Um, but there's a little bit of subtlety, and this is, has often been glossed over by uh, the isogeny community, I think. So um, the issue is that how can you be sure that people really did the right thing, you know? So 
you can imagine an attack where uh, people are doing these random walks and they're chaining them in the correct way, but then suddenly the last participant, let's say, decides to just start over from the starting curve where you know the anamorphisms and produces this random walk and outputs a curve. It looks as random as any other curve. Um, but uh, this one participant actually knows uh, a connection, so they know the anamorphism ring. Um, the way to avoid this is to simply attach a proof of knowledge for uh, each of these isogenies. So uh, it's a proof that shows that only given the end nodes uh, that this participant knows uh, an isogeny between them. And so in the next picture, we're going to see how this avoids the attack. So here uh, we have these connecting isogenies again, as before. And uh, along with each of these secret isogenies, uh, the participant produces a zero knowledge proof that indeed they have computed uh, an isogeny between the correct pair of curves. And uh, they don't output the isogeny, they only output the end nodes and the proof that they, they know this isogeny. Um, okay, so we do this again and again. And uh, then if the attacker again tries to do their uh, dumb attack by just restarting from E0, uh, they're now in trouble because uh, by the specification of this multi-party protocol, they would have to produce an isogeny from E2 to E3. Uh, or like a, a proof of knowledge for an isogeny between this pair of curves, uh, but they have no way of doing that without solving the isogeny problem. And uh, well, ideally they would have a hard time doing this because they also don't know the endomorphism ring of E2. This was produced by another participant, so they can't ask for the endomorphism ring, and uh, so this isogeny problem is presumably hard. And uh, this is indeed the point where I hand over to my co-presenter, so. Hi, everyone. Um, you seen how the trust is set up process works um, at a high level. In our work, we formalize this approach and we prove it secure in the simplified UC model, um, assuming that computing endomorphism strings is a hard problem. And we need to assume that because um, if that was, uh, were uh, an easy task, then the Vudex is not secure at all. And um, to prove that uh, this is secure, we need certain properties from our um, zero-knowledge proof. And these are the classic zero-knowledge proof properties that you always have. But interestingly, the relation that we prove correctness and special soundness is slightly different. In the correctness case, an honest verifier, um, an, honest, an honest prover, uh, shows that they know an isogeny of a specific degree, whereas um, for special soundness, we um, are satisfied with um, an isogeny of, of any possible degree. And in our case, this is um, sufficient because the trusted setup um, work as long as uh, the participant knows a isogeny between any two curves. And on top of that, um, we also wanted a um, zero knowledge proof that is statistically zero knowledge. And the reason for that is that we want to be able to run this, obtain some kind of uh, secure curve and we want to be sure that this is going to be secure even if um, future cryptanalysis uh, solves uh, certain types of problems. So we looked around. We looked at what kind of uh, zero-knowledge proof existed. And they usually all look something like this. We start from an isogeny phi that we want to prove knowledge of. Then we take another isogeny psi, whose uh, degree is co-prime. And we build an SIDH square out of it. Then the challenger requests one of the three isogenies, either the psi, phi prime, or psi prime, and the prover responds with one of the three. And by repeating this process um, many times, the um, verifier can be convinced that uh, the prover indeed knows uh, phi. And the good thing about this type of approach is that um, no auxiliary point is ever revealed, or at least no torsion point is revealed um, under a secret isogeny which means that despite this is, uses techniques very similar to SIDH, this is completely immune to the SIDH attacks. The bad thing, however, is that this uses isogenies whose kernel is defined over FP squared, which means that in some sense these are very, very short isogenies, and it limits the size of um, all the different isogenies. Uh, in particular, we have that psi and phi usually have degree roughly square root of uh, the prime p. And for this reason, um, before our work, all isogeny-based uh, proof of knowledge were only computational. And the reason for that is that there is no big issue around um, psi and psi prime, but whenever the prover reveals phi prime, um, 
then the, there is a computational assumption that the curve E2 together with the associated uh, kernel generator of phi prime is uh, indistinguishable from a random curve with a random uh, kernel generator. Okay, so how do we um, achieve statistical zero knowledge? Um, we know that the super singular isogeny graph, the graph of all super singular curves connected by an isogeny, is Ramanujan. This means that it has very good expander properties and relatively short walks quickly converge to something close to uniform. And even if I'm talking about short walks, this is still like significantly longer than the short isogeny that we uh, that were used in the previous proofs. And uh, here you see a very small example of a super singular isogeny graph. Um, however, as I mentioned before, the zero knowledge property of our um, zero knowledge proof depends on the uniformity of a specific curve with, the associated, uh, with an associated subgroup, which corresponds to the kernel generator of the bottom horizontal isogeny. So um, in order to achieve any kind of uniformity, we need to study the super singular graph with level structure. And in particular, this is the level structure with, um, associated with a particular um, subgroup. So we obtain this kind of uh, graph where um, the nodes correspond to a curve and a particular um, subgroup. And we can see that there is a uh, connection in the graph. If there is an isogeny between um, a curve and another, that maps that specific uh, subgroup to the other. And the good property that we were able to prove is that this graph is also Ramanujan, which means that, again, if we take sufficiently long walks, um, we get fairly quickly to something that is uh, close to uniform. But in this case, compared to the more generic uh, super singular isogeny graph, we reveal more information because uh, not only we know that there is an isogeny between two curves, but we also know that um, its effect on a subgroup, so we necessarily need to take longer walks. So how do we construct a proof that uses longer walks? We need the, the degrees of the isogenies that we are using to be much longer than the prime p, which means that the kernel generators of these isogenies are defined not over fp squared, but over extremely large extension fields, which of course complicates things from a computational point of view. Our solution is to take many different SIDH squares, glue them together, and obtain what we call an SIDH ladder. It looks something like this. So rather than um, taking just one isogeny that is uh, FP2 rational, we do multiple hops. So for instance, we take this one isogeny and then uh, that whose kernel is defined over FP squared, and then we repeat the process. And the same way for um, the isogeny that is co-prime or has co-prime degree, we do this multiple, uh, multiple step, multiple hops, um, so that they can achieve the length, the degree that we want. But then how do we construct a full on um, square out of this? The idea is that we start very small, we build an SIDH square, considering only the first two, the first horizontal and the first vertical one, and uh, then we use that as a starting point for the next. We use this vertical isogeny and this horizontal one to build a square. And then we repeat the process for every row and every column until we obtain a full on square. And now we can use this to do exactly the same type of um, zero knowledge proof as before, where um, we receive a challenge uh, one out of three, and we either reveal this um, left composition of isogenies or much longer isogeny, the bottom one or the right vertical one. And uh, computationally, this is of course much more expensive than the previous one. And um, the reason for that is that because um, while computing isogenies is um, log linear in their degree, the computation of an SIDH ladder is uh, quadrating in the number of SIDH squares that make up the, um, the ladder. But the interesting thing is that we don't just achieve statistical zero knowledge with this type of approach, but we're also able for the first time to um, prove knowledge of an isogeny regardless of its degree or its uh, base field. So before we had uh, sev several constraints on, degree, on the degree of the isogenies and the prime, but now we can prove knowledge of any isogeny um, in any base field. And the way that we do this um, in some cases is that we just go over a small extension field where um, 
um, where the, at least some, some part of the isogeny is defined, and then we build an SIDH ladder that is, um, there's um, several very tiny one-hop SIDH squares. And we actually implemented this. Um, we considered the four SIDH primes that um, were used uh, for SIDH, but this, uh, of course, works for any, price, any prime of your choice. And you can see here the length of the isogeny works both for the horizontal isogenies and the vertical one. And you can see that these uh, are significantly longer than the isogenies that are used in, uh, in SIDH. And what we get is that uh, the proof sizes are just a few hundred kilobytes, um, so not particularly, not extremely too large. And the running times are also um, somewhat uh, compact. Um, for the smallest prime, we get that uh, proving is a couple of seconds and verification is uh, a few milliseconds, whereas um, this scales to about uh, 30 seconds and uh, two seconds um, to prove and verify. And all these numbers are um, just examples that were run on a laptop. And this may not be extremely practical for all sort of applications that uh, zero knowledge proofs are used, but within the trusted setup protocol, this is uh, very practical. The reason for that is that we have that uh, participants only really need to run this once. Um, so even if this takes 30 seconds, it wouldn't be a big issue. And we also get that uh, verification is significantly faster than proving, which also helps uh, because then we would want some kind of central server to verify and ensure that um, all of this is uh, correct. And indeed, we do plan to run uh, a trusted setup ceremony in practice. Um, and we're excited about that because um, after the ceremony is run, we would obtain the very first um, secure curves um, that uh, so far no such curve has ever been created. Uh, so those would be the, the very first of their kind. Thank you very much for your attention and we're more than happy to take any questions. We have time for questions. Okay, it's, it's kind of both a comment and a question. So I think there's, there are a lot of parallels to kind of trusted setups in the kind of snark world. And I was wondering I mean, what you learned from how they did it and what is kind of different or, yeah, just a shout out to that. Like as they are called like powers of tau and stuff like that, yeah. Yeah, I think the, I mean, the techniques involved are quite different, but um, the type of uh, sort of like real life um, limitations that are imposed are um, quite similar. So now that we're looking to concretely run this in practice, um, we have been looking at how this, uh, this was done uh, to learn. We're not planning to burn any laptops on stage, but um, we are trying to uh, learn and copy as much as possible from those kind of approaches. Okay, uh, let's thank Andrea and Lawrence again. or is it just this? Okay. Oh. The next talk is on valence conjecture, impossibility of incrementally verifiable computation from random oracles by Jesper Booz Nielsen and Matthias Hall Anderson. And Matthias will give the talk. Thank you, Jaya. Uh, yeah, so I'm standing behind you and lunch. So uh, be between you and lunch is yet another talk about IVC. So what is IVC? I'm going to do the introduction again. So imagine we have some prover, uh, the penguin wants to convince, you know, some verifier, the vulture, that he applied some function uh, n times to some initial state st0. And after doing so, he obtained some uh, state stn. So of course, uh, the, the vulture is, uh, is questioning this, this proposition. Um, luckily, we have, you know, this, this great literature of like computational integrity proofs. So the, the, prover, the, the prover penguin can just like send over the the state, the claimed state, and then uh, some sort of inc uh, integrity proof that this was computed correctly. 
Okay. So now, uh, a few seconds later, the prover wants to, to prove something uh, slightly different. He wants to prove that he, he now applied the function n plus one times. Um, of course, the verifier still requires proof of this. Again, he can compute a proof and, and send over the, the resulting state. Um, so obviously, the new state can easily be obtained from the old state by just like, applying the function once more. Uh, but what about computing the new proof from the old proof? So like rather than, I mean, if, if I have to uh, recompute my proof and it takes, you know, uh, order of n uh, to compute the proof, right, then that, that's going to be terrible. So we want to compute the new proof in something that is essentially independent of, of n. So just slightly more formally, right, there's like some initial state and some initial proof. You can just think of the initial proof as like the empty string. Like really proof that like ST0 goes to ST0 after zero applications. And you can apply a function, you get a, a new state, and there's a proving algorithm that takes the, the previous proof and the previous state and produces a, a new proof. And you can feed this proof to a verifier along with, uh, with the original state and the new state. And the verifier will either accept or reject. Um, you can then apply the function once more and the prover once more to, uh, to the old state of the proof, obtain a new proof. And you, of course, you can verify this as well, and so on and so forth. Uh, we want that the prover's complexity is, is uh, I mean, depends on, on, on f, uh, but it's like logarithmic in, in, in the length. And similar for the verifier. Okay, so I'm going to briefly introduce the random oracle model. I assume it's not really necessary, but we'll go. So in, in this model, you know, we have our, our two parties again. Um, but in order to, to build any, any one of these constructions, they also have access to a uh, random oracle. So what does the random oracle do, right? They, they, can, they, can, they can access this oracle, and when, when the prover submits a, a query queue, the random oracle first looks up, if I'm, I'm using a lazy definition here, right? So it like looks up if, if uh, there's an entry in the table, in which case it just returns the, the response R as looking up the value in the table. Otherwise, it samples a new random value and returns it to the prover. Okay, so uh, Valiant uh, initially came up with this, uh, with this, um, with this primitive, this definition, um, and its construction is, is from CS proofs and nominally in, in the random oracle model, as we'll see. So imagine you have some uh, state zero to state one. Of course, I can, I can compute uh, a CS proof, like a, a snark, that, that this computation was done correctly. So for, for one step, it's easy. Then I can apply the, the step once more. And of course, I can also compute a, a proof uh, for this transition. And then uh, what Valiant does is that then he then proves, um, he, he constructs a proof that uh, the verification of the two subproofs uh, is correct. So now you don't need to set these two proofs along anymore. You can extend once more. Of course, you can pr prove the, the, the new state transition. And uh, once more, you aggregate uh, these two proofs. And then you can aggregate the, the final set of proofs. So at the end, you have like one proof. And at any one time, you sort of like hold the frontier of the tree. Like this, this particular comp composition is done for like reasons of uh, extraction. So the problem here is that, as the, as the other IVC talk hinted at, is that this proof down here is in the ROM, uh, but the proof itself can only prove things about NP relations, so like plain computation without any random oracles. So it means that in order for this to work, in order for you to, to compute this proof, you need to heuristically instantiate the, the ROM for these, for these proofs. Uh, which means that the construction is not actually in the, in the random oracle model, right? Because you can't, you, 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 you could, the, the construction does not exist in the ROM. Um, and of course, Valiant noted this. So if you look at the paper, you'll find something like this. Recursion breaks down because even at the first level of recursion, we're no longer trying to prove statements about classical computation, but rather statements of the form, you know, a machine with Oracle access to uh, the random Oracle accepts the following string, right? Uh, and he notes that thus the, the standard application of, of random Oracles did not appear to, to help you in, in, in construction this. So to which extent can we sort of like prove this intuition? Uh, an intuition that like many people who have looked at this problem sort of have. Um, so like, what can we say about it formally? Okay. So the first thing is that I've kind of been promising too much. 
So I can't really say that much about IBC itself, but I can say something about non-deterministic IBC, which was also the version of IBC that was described in the previous talk. Um, so ideally, we would like to say something strong like this. But the problem is that it's hard to even rule out sort of trivial schemes that don't even like uh, query the random oracle. Indeed, there is even a construction with, uh, with CRS from somewhere statistically binding uh, hash functions. So what we can do instead is we can introduce a witness. So this is the same like, uh, version of, of IBC that was like, described in, uh, in, uh, in the ARON talk. Um, so now computation is non-deterministic, so it takes a state and some witness. It, it, the function uh, takes a state and, and a witness and it produces some new state. Okay. So is non-deterministic IBC uh, still interesting? Or have I just like made up a thing and then proved an impossibility about it? Uh, well, it covers PCD. PCD is a special uh, case. Um, natural schemes can sort of be extended. So uh, valiant scheme in particular can be extended to non-deterministic IBC. Uh, it also justifies like many of these new models uh, for randomized, uh, for, for random oracles. Um, so for instance, uh, this low degree ROM as well as the, as the A ROM. And also uh, we can construct you know, snarks for all of NP in, in the ROM, uh, but doing so uh, in the, in, uh, but, doing, but building non-deterministic IBC uh, is, is harder. Okay, so I have this, this, this claim here that it does not help, right? that's not a formal claim. So what does it mean that it doesn't help you to introduce a, a random oracle? It means that I have this, I mean, for first, we're doing this for non-deterministic IBC. Then we have this non-triviality uh, assumption, which basically see that it says that you can generate accepting proofs for true statements uh, by programming the ROM. Which kind of means that if, if, if you couldn't cheat, if you couldn't generate a cheating proof by, 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 by manipulating uh, the random oracle, right, it means that the, the, the proof is sound for any instantiation of the random oracle, which means it's, it's, the random oracle is not doing anything. You can just output, you just hard code it to, to some value. Um, and we have two results, uh, one that is relatively uh, intuitive and, and one that is, 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 is somewhat more convoluted. Uh, so the first one just says that, you know, if I can generate these accepting proofs and they're actually uh, zero knowledge, right? So there exists a, a zero knowledge uh, simulator that by reprogramming the random oracle can produce indistinguishable proofs, then, then you're always toast. Yes. Okay, so I can't go into uh, full detail of, uh, of the impossibility, but I'll sort of give a, a high level proof sketch. Uh, the proof is, is quite long and convoluted for relatively on interesting reasons, so like here is, is the, the high level idea. So imagine I have like many applications of, uh, of my scheme. Um, so this is like many steps of the non-deterministic IVC, right? So now it takes, it takes a witness additionally. Uh, I can look at the, at the queries being made by the verifier at the very last step, right? I can look at the random oracle queries being made by the verifier here at the very last step, right? And then I can consider, hey, what if I, instead of proving this step, what if I, what if I simulated it, right? So by simulating it, I get a bunch of uh, random oracle queries that need to be reprogrammed. So of course, like, moving beyond this point, if, if, if uh, the, at, at this point onwards, right, the random oracle is gonna be the reprogrammed random oracle. Um, but intuitively, if, if, if the intersection between the place that I am uh, reprogramming the random oracle, and the verifier queries at the end, it's empty, then, then, then I already have a problem, right? Something is already fishy. Um, and the proof really just observes that I can make this uh, uh, arbitrarily high, essentially, um, by simply noting that the verifier's complexity is, is low, right? The verifier's complexity is low, so it must make a few random oracle queries. But so by simply extending more times, right, I can, the probability that he will make some particular uh, query made at a particular point. Uh, if I select that point randomly, so I, can't, I can also not just like fix a, a point at which I'm reprogramming, because it could just be that you know, at step five, 
I make a random Oracle query and, and, and all the random Oracle queries in step five are always made. So by taking a random place and extending sufficiently long, I can prove that this, 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 this happens with very high probability. Uh, and then the, the proof is essentially just that if this condition is met, then the final proof is actually accepting under the real Oracle, right? Because then by extending with a reprogrammed Oracle for some long number of steps, right, I have replaced all the queries made to the reprogrammed Oracle with just queries made to the original Oracle. Okay. So in order to take this uh, all the way home, oops, there's an animation problem here. I need a language where distinguishing uh, membership where like I, I need a language where deciding if something is in the language or not is um, is hard, right? Because I, I I I need something where the the prover couldn't just, for instance, when I give him a false statement, he would just not ac uh, output a, an accepting proof. Uh, and in order to do this, we just use uh, re-random perfectly binding re-randomizable commitments, so like Bill Kamal uh, encryptions, for instance, right? So then at this point, you have a claim. So this would be uh, a commitment to zero. Uh, and all the witnesses would be re-randomizations. So you would re-randomize. F is really re-randomizing the commitment. And then at this step, I replace the state with a commitment to one. I simulate. The simulator cannot distinguish between these two, so it produces a, an accepting proof in the re in the, for the reprogrammed uh, oracle. And then I keep extending, you know, again, re-randomizing just by completeness of the <laughs> re-randomizable uh, commitment scheme, I end up with a commitment to, uh, uh, to one, uh, going from a commitment to zero, uh, which, is, uh, which breaks down this. Oh. OK. So at which point are we actually using the zero knowledge requirement? Well, we're really just using it to ensure that the prover doesn't do something stupid. Starts like do, 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 doing something, something wild when I'm giving it like a simulated proof, right? So if you remove the zero knowledge assumption and just said, you know, you can give me an accepting proof, uh, you could have a prover that's like, oh, that's an accepting proof. That's very nice. Now I'm not going to give you an accepting proof when I extend. It could do that. Um, so we have a, a second result. It's like it's, it, it, it essentially says that, you know, to which extent can I, can I just remove this your knowledge assumption and just say, you know, you can produce false proofs by programming the random oracle. Um, and we rule out schemes. It's a some, somewhat, somewhat strange state. We rule out schemes in which there exists uh, an algorithm that takes, you know, basically the verifier state and some query, and it tells us whether this query was previously made by the prover. Right? So like in the honest computation of this, um, like assuming that the, that the, I mean, you just de-randomize the prover, or, yeah, you just ask, would the prover have previously made this query? And it outputs whether or not the query was previously made. And this algorithm is allowed to fail with, uh, with, non -no uh, with noticeable probability. Right? So it's like in a scheme, for instance, where you have a, a fresh query at like every step, right? like just guessing that that query has never been made is, 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 a, is a valid strategy. If you have a scheme wherein there's like a fixed set of queries that are always being made, just getting that those are always made is, is, is also a valid instance of this algorithm. Um, so it, it, it seems kind of like, it, it will be, it's kind of a weird scheme that would circumvent this. Uh, and that actually brings me to the end of my talk. We have time for questions. I have a lot of time for questions. Uh, thanks. Great talk. Um, so you mentioned in the last slide about the zero knowledge that you need the zero knowledge to ensure that the prover acts normally on a, on a simulated, yes. uh, like accepting proof. Yes. So uh, you could, uh, you can strengthen the definition of IVC to say that the prover always has to work if if I'm give, if it's given an accepting yeah. proof, even if that's yeah. not an honestly generated yeah. one. That does that circumvent this no. issue? Okay. No, because it could it could, for instance, see oh, this is a simulated proof. I will still produce a valid proof, but I will keep making uh, some random Oracle query that I know was like reprogrammed. Right? I see. So it could be like, I, I see that this is a simulated proof. Here are the random Oracle queries that you made uh, when verifying this, this, this previous state of the proof. I'm just always going to keep making those. And then you can't use this argument that, that Oracle queries get replaced. Right? Okay. So you could, you could have a pathological uh, behavior from the, like, exchange behavior from the, from the, from the prover. 
Okay, great. Thank you. Um, also about the zero knowledge requirement. So proofs that are succinct can be shown to satisfy like weaker notions of zero knowledge, right? Would that suffice for your proof to go through? Or like is witnessing that distinguishability? Or like, um, you know? No, like zero knowledge for random instances. I think you can show okay. that if it's succinct, then it does satisfy some weaker notions. So is there intuition for why you need full zero knowledge or is it like an artifact of your proof? Um, I'm not exactly 100% sure, so. Okay. Any more questions? Okay, let's thank Matthias and all speakers of the session.